Right. Good morning, everybody, um, or good evening, or whatever it is where you are. Um, welcome to the Daiwa Anglo Japanese Foundation um, for this uh, book launch. Uh, the book is called Voices for the from the Contemporary Japanese Feminist Movement, and I've been asked to mention also that this event is part of the 16 Days of Activism Against Gender Based Violence, uh, which is a campaign led by the UN that uh, kicks off every year on. The International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, which was the 25th of November. Um, and so the 16 days run until the 10th of December. Also briefly introduce our two panelists before we start. Um, so the first speaker is going to be Dr. Emma Dalton, um, and she's joining us from Melbourne in Australia. Uh, and then it's Dr. Caroline Norma, who is coming from Tokyo. And I'll briefly introduce them. So Dr. Emma Dalton um, has had roles at a number of Japanese universities. She was a visiting professor at Nagoya City University, a lecturer at Kanda University of International Studies, and she's also worked for Likyo and Sofia universities. Um, and she is currently um, a lecturer in Japanese studies at La Trobe University. And her research is on women in Japanese politics. Uh, and she's published a book last year, Sexual Harassment in Japanese Politics. And then our other speaker is Dr. Caroline Norma. Um, she also has been at a number of Japanese universities and she is a lecturer uh, in the Master of Translating and Interpreting course at RMIT University. And her research focuses on the comfort women issue uh, in the Second World War, um, but she also works on Japan's contemporary sex industry. So please, over to Dr. Emma Dalton. Thank you, Jason, for that very nice introduction. Um, okay, so you can all hear me? It's all good? Okay. Um, I'd like to extend my gratitude to the Daiwa Anglo-Japanese Foundation for showing interest in our work and kindly hosting this book launch event. And thank you, everyone, for coming. I speak to you from my home in Melbourne, where it is the beginning of summer and just after 9pm. The COVID pandemic has wrought terrible devastation around the world, but the fact that we are holding this launch via this forum is truly wonderful. And both Caroline and I are very grateful to the organisers, Nana Ota and her colleagues, and for the interest in our research shown by those in attendance. Caroline and I approached the publisher of our book, Palgrave Macmillan, in mid-2020 with our proposal. We decided that it was probably time to write a book in English to update the available academic material on the Japanese um, grassroots feminist movement. Sandra Buckley's Broken Silence, Voices of Japanese Feminism was now more than two decades old. At the time of us sending our proposal to the publisher, I was in the process of finishing my book that was published in 2021 on the sexual harassment of women in Japanese politics. And I was fresh back from field work for that. So I was full of ideas and um, I had an up-to-date understanding of the on-the-ground situation for women and what sort of activism was going on, mostly in Tokyo. Caroline was also in Japan. I had been in Tokyo and she had been in Kyoto. I had interviewed over 40 politicians across Japan about sexual harassment and in the process gained an insight into what I quickly discovered was a hot button issue for feminist activists and politicians on the left end of the political spectrum, but also something that feminist activists had been organizing around for decades. The same year, 2019, was the year that the flower demo events started. These are monthly events held in every prefecture of Japan that became a place for victims of sexual violence to talk about their experiences and their feelings of anger, sadness and confusion publicly, safe in the knowledge that they would not be criticised or blamed. These events were instigated by feminists, including one of the contributors to this book, Hitahara Minori. They were angry about four particularly egregious um, court cases in March or April that year that had acquitted men of sexual crimes. 
Something else that had happened in late 2019 was journalist Ito Shiori had won her civil case against her accused uh, rapist Yamaguchi Noriyuki. Yamaguchi was also a journalist. He had ties to the governing Liberal Democratic Party and was on good terms with the then Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and had written glowing biographies about him. Ito Shiori, in accusing Yamaguchi, essentially took on the powerful LDP. The backlash to her by the media and sections of the general public was swift and brutal. Her courage and determination came at a great cost, and she eventually left Japan because she believed she would be unable to have a career in Japan given the treatment she had received. Her case was highly publicised both internationally and domestically, perhaps more so internationally, and she emboldened many women in Japan to speak up about their own experiences of sexual assault and harassment. She became the face of Japan's Me Too movement. So my fieldwork in 2019 not only yielded data for my book on sexual harassment in politics, it coincided with a moment in Japanese feminist activism that because of the content of my research spoke loudly and clearly to me about the reality of women's continued oppression under male sexual violence. The confluence of the people I met and the nature of the grassroots feminist activism I saw, including Ito Shiori's public assertions, laid the groundwork for the book being launched today. During those six months of fieldwork for my previous book, I met lots of feminist activists and reconnected with feminist politicians from all levels of government, some of whom I had known for years. I left Japan in January 2020, filled with a buoyancy that I had absorbed from the modest but somewhat optimistic and victim support, uh, victims um, survivor-led feminist movement. I had met and heard lectures by some of the women who had come to contribute to the book that was not yet even an idea in my head, but their lectures writings and activism certainly planted the seed. Mitsui Mariko, one of the contributors to the book, had probably planted the seed many years previously. I had known Mitsui from my PhD research since uh, 2007. And uh, doing, my re doing the research for this new book, I was surprised to learn uh, that she is in fact in her mid seventies, and this would surprise anyone who knew her, given her level of energy and youthful vitality. Mitsui has been a feminist and an activist for most of her life. I am so glad that she contributed to the book because her chapter gives a great insight into the evolution of grassroots feminist activism against the sexual objectification of women from the nineteen seventies until today. Mitsui began her activism in 1976 by joining Kodo Surukai, the International Women's Year Action Group, a national feminist organisation that formed after the 1975 United Nations World Conference on Women, which sparked the UN Decade for Women. She had a career as a teacher, during which time she tried to teach children about gender equality and participated in feminist activism outside her work hours like ripping down pornographic posters from public places and protesting the sex tours that major Japanese travel companies freely advertised. In 1987, she was elected to the Tokyo Metropolitan Assembly, representing the Japan Socialist Party. She quit in 1993, citing sexual harassment inside her own party. She was appalled at the lack of women in politics. So in 1992, formed the Alliance of Feminist Representatives, which today has around 200 members across the country and is an important coalition of female politicians concerned with creating policies that improve gender equality and most significantly with increasing the number of women elected to political office. Mitsui has a broad and worldly outlook on things and she is hugely inspired by the political situation and uh, the feminists in Norway. She has written widely on gender quota systems in Nordic countries and advocates for something similar to be introduced in Japan, while recognising 
that given there are so many legislative councils in Japan, particularly in the rural areas with very few women, some of them have no women at all, that a gender quota might be a little bit ambitious for some councils. Mitsui Mariko has been written about before, both in English and in Japanese, because her life achievements and her contributions to the feminist movement are extraordinary. And they continue today. She herself has written 12 books. I hope our chapter, nonetheless, adds another layer to the already existing literature on Mitsui by updating it for today's context and by placing it in the context of the activities of other feminists in the book, many of whom Mitsui knows well. In December 2019, Caroline and I attended the Japan Association of Gender and Law Conference at Wong Southern University. Here, we heard one of the contributors to the book, Yamamoto Jun, give a keynote presentation. The interest in her experience and what she had to say about the number situation for victims of sexual crime was palpable in the room of around 100 attendees. Caroline and I were also keenly affected by her powerful presentation. And later, when we decided to write the book, decided to approach her to be a contributor. Yamamoto's experience as a survivor of incest drove her to organize for legal change for victims. She started a group called Spring and became a consultant to the government committee on amending the sexual crime section of the penal code, which happened in 2017 after 110 years of no change. Many feminist activists saw the 2017 changes as inadequate because of a number of things, including the still too low age of consent, which remains at 13, and the requirement for rape prosecution that victims proved they were unable to resist. Yamamoto is now on a government advisory committee, and here she continues to represent victim survivors and work towards ensuring that amendments are included in the next round of revisions to the Penal Code. The third feminist contributor to the book I want to briefly uh, introduce is also concerned about protecting women and girls from sexual abuse by men. Nito Yumeno is in her early 30s and the youngest of the contributors. Like Yamamoto, Nito's childhood experiences inf informed her outlook on life and propelled her into action for others like her. As a teenager, she experienced an unsettled home life and resulting intermittent homelessness. She wandered the streets of Shibuya late into the night on school nights with other girls like her and was exposed to the predatory sex trade that animates certain parts of Tokyo at night time. After finding her way out of her situation, she went to university and eventually, in 2017, founded an organisation called Collabo, which aims to provide a space for girls and young women who have nowhere to go at night. Collabo is an outreach setup that offers a non-judgmental space where girls can go to get some food or snacks, pick up some clothing, recharge their phones and chat to others if they like. I've made it sound very cute and lovely, but Nito has, in fact, shone a light on the problem of the sexual predation of young and vulnerable girls in Tokyo. What was for a long, called, a long time called uh, compensated dating in English language studies of Japanese society, a direct translation of the problematic Japanese term enjo korsai, uh, has been exposed um, largely thanks to Nitor's work, as a male-created fantasy and a male-created problem. Framed in the 1990s as an issue of female youthful delinquency, compensated dating represented the degeneration of girls' behaviour and morals during Japan's first so-called lost decade, that is, the decade that followed the bursting of Japan's economic bubble in 1989. Schoolgirls were, according to this narrative, exchanging sexual favours for luxury brand goods provided by much older men. Nito, through her work, has turned this narrative on its head to point the finger squarely at the men who sexually exploit children, who are wandering the streets because of problems at home or at school. She says in the chapter of our book, 
and, uh, and I quote, I have a problem with this term. I mean, how is it assistance or compensation? Surely it's only in Japan that issues of child prostitution and the sexual exploitation of children are spoken about using a term like this, a term that implies an adult is helping out a child. It's a relationship of power and violence, not one of equality, which is what the word dating suggests. It's a term created from a male perspective. Nikol has strong public speaking skills, networking techniques, and an ability to convey sophisticated analyses of social problems. This gets her invited onto TV chat shows regularly. She is also a member of the Tokyo Metropolitan Government Youth, Pro Youth Problems Commission and acts as a consultant to the Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare Committee to address female disadvantage. Her observations based on her own experiences as a high school dropout and her grassroots activism with children seeking refuge in the streets of Shibuya from abusive households is that uh, the only people who try to help these girls are predatory men who attempt to use them sexually themselves or lure them into the sex trade. Nito argues that vulnerable children should be protected from this predation and that existing social services are inadequate and that the pervasive culture is still one that places the blame on the sexually exploited girls rather than the men who exploit them. I'll now um, pass over to Caroline, who's going to introduce the other three contributors to the book. Thanks so much, Emma, and also thanks to the Dala Foundation um, and for everyone participating today for the interest shown, not in just the book, but also the Japanese feminist movement. And I'll talk more about how important that interest is to us as uh, authors and uh, to our work in a minute. But thank you very much. So for this second part of the presentation, I'll speak briefly about the three other contributors to the voices from the contemporary Japanese feminist movement book that we're launching today. And then I'll conclude, uh, conclude upon our joint comments and leave time, uh, hopefully any questions and comments that anyone might have will be very, very grateful. The three contributors I will describe are Yang Chinja from the Comfort Women Advocacy Organization Kibo no Tane, Kitahara, Kitahara Minori, who Emma mentioned, who was the founder of the flower, so-called flower demo, sexual violence protest movement in 2019. And then finally, Tsunoda Yukiko, who is a long time feminist lawyer and scholar who worked on behalf of women accessing the Tokyo, Tokyo Rape Crisis Center. These three women are all connected to Japan's feminist movement in its current form, centrally, but have also experienced feminism in Japan in other historical eras. In the case of Tsunoda, who was in her 70s, actually, uh, late 70s, when we interviewed her last year, she experienced the era in which feminism was perhaps strongest in Japan in the post-war period. Her work representing victims of rape and workplace sexual harassment goes back to the 1970s, when some recognisably radical feminist groups did exist in Japan, even if wider Japanese society uh, at that time was unable to recognise even the weakest of liberal feminist claims, mostly uh, even less so than it does today. Because of this long-standing involvement in feminism, Tsunada was able to convey to us a sense of historical progression in the movement. Most concerning for her was the ongoing failure of this movement to understand workplace sexual harassment as a sex-based harm and to lobby for legal change accordingly. Instead, Tsunada told us, even feminists continue to support the approach that was forged in the 1970s in which victims bring civil claims against sexual harassment perpetrators for damages, which are obviously very limited in value in Japan's civil courts. Tsunada, in her interview, complained about this individualistic liberal approach of uh, Japan's contemporary feminist movement, which fails to see sexual harassment as a matter of the state and of lawmaking, criminal lawmaking. Kitahara Minori, on the other hand, is a currently influential feminist activist around the same age as me, she's in her early 50s, who reflected upon her earlier views of women's situation in Japan. In the 1990s, Kitahara actually worked uh, as a journalist for a men's magazine covering uh, sex industry ventures, actually, um, endeavours of the pornography industry, 
um, and initiatives of the sex industry in general. And this background led her solidly at that time towards a libertarian world view. In her chapter in our book, she describes therefore regretting the withdrawal of so-called pornography magazines for women from convenience stores in the late 1990s. At the time, Kitahara experienced this regret on libertarian grounds in terms of pornography as a means of sexual freedom for women. But in 2019, when, on the other hand, pornographic magazines uh, for male consumption were uh, withdrawn from uh, convenience stores in preparation for the Tokyo Olympics, Kitahara reflected on her previous political outlook and realised that um, the withdrawal of pornography, so-called pornography for women from convenience stores, uh, really was a red herring in terms of women's status and condition at that time because she realised and thought back to the fact that nappies, as in baby, nappies for babies, weren't even available in convenience stores in Japan at that time. And so that was a much better and more realistic um, sort of um, barometer of women's uh, status in Japan at that time, but she'd been sort of misled by this uh, pornography issue. Yang Chinja, who has led political organising in Japan since the early 1990s in support of the so-called comfort women, Japanese military slaves of the Second World War, um, was aged almost exactly between Sunada and Kitahara when we interviewed her last year. She is still centrally active in the feminist movement in Japan today and experienced the activist height of the comfort women advocacy movement as it happened in Japan in the 1990s. Young Tinja is a, a Japanese Korean bilingual speaker and as a result has acted as a major bridge between the two countries, the comfort women advocacy movements of the two countries um, since the 1990s and facilitated, facilitated their cross country collaboration. The Comfort Women Advocacy Movement in Japan today is a shadow of its former self of the 1990s, um, but interesting historical reflection still comes through in Young Chinja's chapter in our book. Interesting is that she observes that uh, today it is South Korean young women who lead the global feminist movement, perhaps even more actively than the, uh, their mothers, the South Korean women of the 1990s. As a result, her uh, organisational activities today centre on, this is Kipo no Tane, centre on sponsoring young Japanese women to travel to South Korea to, collab to collaborate with their uh, feminist counterparts over there, over the issue of the comfort women. And in fact, um, the, the sponsorship is not limited actually to uh, young women particularly, it's just that they happen to be the majority of applicants to the scheme. This backdrop to feminism in Japan today was noted by a number of, our, of the contributors that we spoke to. In other words, the strength and the activity of feminism in South Korea since 2015 that has influenced activists in Japan in a number of ways, even if the, the full radicalism of that movement hasn't yet hit Japan's shores. Feminism took off in South Korea even before the American Me Too movement and culminated in mass feminist rallies in Seoul over the whole of 2018 and the passing of a number of laws against digital sexual exploitation, as well as, as well as the lifting of the age of consent in Korea from 13 to age 16, which obviously, as Emma mentioned, hasn't happened in Japan yet. In fact, the achievements of the Korean feminist movement since 2015 are so comprehensive and extensive that I couldn't even begin to, to describe, uh, to list them up for, for us here today. But this major upheaval happening in the society of Japan's closest neighbour, at a time when social media and online translation apps proliferated amongst young women in Japan particularly, this meant that many feminists in the movement of contemporary Japan retain close and active links to South Korea, they travel there often now, they translate their feminist books now, and they invite Korean feminist sisters to come and speak in Japan about their activities. One major effect of the rise of South Korean feminism has been the spread of anti-prostitution ideas in Japan, as Emma alluded to. South Korea introduced a form of legislation in 2004 that is favoured by radical feminists for penalising sex buyers and pimps while treating women bought for prostitution as victims of crime and therefore eligible for any number of recovery services, um, financial subsidy, et cetera, et cetera. But information about this major change that occurred in South Korea in 2004 was actually slow to hit Japan, I feel. Um, 
I, I've been interacting with the Japanese anti-prostitution and anti-pornography movement for 10 years or more now. And I remember coming to Japan yeah, 10 years ago and talking about the change in South Korea and not getting a, a huge response at that time. But now uh, everything has changed and now there are anti-prostitution events and actions, campaigns, initiatives in Tokyo nearly every week now. And feminists know all about the Korean model and the sisters there who are involved in promoting it. So while the, the Korean legislation does come from an era earlier than the feminist uprising that we have in this era, um, nonetheless, uh, it was the contemporary feminist movements of both countries in the present that worked together to introduce the Korean model to Japan today and now results in a very strong anti-prostitution movement uh, in Japan. All three women I've mentioned, Tsunoda, Kitahara and Yang Tinja, have significant connections internationally, even if Tsunoda and Kitahara are linked mainly to the English speaking world rather than South Korea. Back in the early 1990s, this link was useful for Tsunoda in being able to travel to America to study with the American feminist scholar of jurisprudence, Catherine McKinnon. Unfortunately, though noticeable in our book, I think, is an almost complete absence of involvement or influence of English speaking feminists in the lives of our interviewees today. And here's where I throw, throw back to um, our gratitude to the Daiwa Foundation and participants today for showing an interest. So in the book, we focus on this lack of involvement by English speaking feminists in the Japanese movement. And this isn't because we think that Western feminism needs to play any role in any particular country in any particular time. Rather, we think to and contrast this situation with what we see as the major contribution of scholarship, of activism, of translation, even art projects um, and journalism of English speaking um, academics and activists to the Okinawan anti-base movement. And this has been happening over 30 years. In comparison to this, the lack of interest among English speakers in Japan's feminist movement and lack of involvement in its activities on the ground uh, seem to stand out to us as an unfortunate and puzzling gap. It remains the case that English language scholarship, when it does turn its attention to issues of gender in Japan, tends to focus on so-called boys love manga, shoujo manga, cosplay, and all of these uh, cultural products. We might wonder why the political activity of Japanese women, different from Japanese men who were involved in the anti-base movement in Okinawa or the environmental protection movements of uh, post-Fukushima, why, when it comes to women, it tends to be focused on cultural issues and products rather than their um, political activity organised through social movements. Of course, we can indeed say that English speaking women abroad do make contributions to Japanese society in many ways, and I know many joining today have done so, uh, and that shouldn't be minimised or overlooked. However, our particular interest in the contribution that English speaking feminists make to the movement in Japan relates specifically to one aspect of the sex based oppression that we see Japanese women as facing. Both historically and today, Japanese women are traded by men in the English speaking world as pornography and are sexualized through cultural products and trafficked into brothels actually in English speaking cities. And uh, a Japanese woman was found in a brothel in Melbourne having been sex trafficked there last year. This Western sexualization has a long history among English speaking men going back to the 19th century trafficking of Japanese women as karayuki and also through the Shunga Ukiyo-e pornographic prints that circulated around the same historic era. So while Japanese women are subject to many forms of oppression, and most of these are um, functions of the, the, their domestic situation, either in the domestic labour market or um, internal Japanese households, it's this problem of sexualization that has a direct con connection to the Western world, and in relation to which feminists abroad might take action. Feminist women in the academy in particular might feel a stronger sense of responsibility to take such action because of the number of male academics currently producing scholarship in defense of things like child pornographic manga and practices like so-called shibari, which is BDSM. Genres of pornography that mention Japanese women and girls are popular among populations of men abroad, but are obviously damaging to the status of Japanese women internationally who are trivialized and infantilized. 
worse still, their conditions of extreme sex inequality within Japan. And this sex inequality, I think, we think can be described as extreme now, um, is therefore minimised and disregarded um, as a product of, of that those external conditions. So to conclude our uh, joint comments um, here, we really hope that the book will give English speakers enough inside knowledge uh, and a, a sense of affinity that they might feel drawn to different parts of Japan's feminist movement and begin to contribute to it or, or focus on it more squarely in their activism or their, their academic work. We hope the example of Korean feminists will inspire feminists in other parts of the world to similarly launch efforts of collaboration and exchange with Japanese activists. While the Japanese movement is neither strong nor growing at the moment, unfortunately, we think that an understanding of global sisterhood should first involve supporting movements in countries like Japan, where women's situation does appear to be in decline. Supporting existing feminist campaigns and already active feminists in Japan, we think is one way in which all of us can, all of us abroad can put an international spotlight on a country whose men to date have enjoyed too much cultural and economic protection internationally in their suppression of half of the population uh, in the country. Thank you very much. Okay, well, um, thank you all very much. I'm going to wrap it up now. So just to mention again, the book um, is called Voices from the Contemporary Japanese Feminist Movement. It's published by Paul Grave Macmillan. Um, so you should be able to find it in the usual uh, online places and in hopefully some good bookshops, academic bookshops. Um, but uh, thank you so much for taking part from uh, Australia and Japan. Um, in both places, it's getting quite late. Um, and thank you to all of us in the UK for starting reasonably early in the morning. I don't think we've ever done one as early as 10 a.m. before. It's usually lunchtime. Um, so really interesting discussion and hope to see you all at the Daiwa Anglo-Japanese Foundation again soon. <laughs>